Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, welcome to our first Civic Practice Symposium here at uh, Leslie MFA in our 2020 uh, residency in January. Uh, I'm the director of the MFA program here at Leslie, Ben Sloat. Uh, a few po points of housekeeping. First, uh, please silence your cell phones. Uh, two is if you have to leave early for any reason, please do not leave over th through that door. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, <laughs> and also we'd prefer if you um, had to leave, you could wait until after the speaker so you don't walk in front of the speaker as they're speaking uh, at our main door. Uh, our general thematic uh, for this general residency is the vernacular legacy, which considers the wider social, historical, or political impacts of the everyday within a, a larger artistic practice. Uh, I want to invite you all to our uh, succeeding pu public programs after this one. Our art talks start tomorrow uh, with a talk by mixed media which, uh, artist Rachel Perry, uh, photographer and chair of uh, BFA Photo here at Leslie, Christine Collins on Tuesday, uh, curator and writer Ellen Tani on Wednesday, and mixed media artist Gallup Horace Kim on Thursday, and all talks are here at 7 o'clock. Uh, to get this started, I want to introduce the Director of Community Engagement here at Leslie, <laughs> Catherine Shizawa. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good evening. I would like to begin by acknowledging that today's gathering takes place on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag peoples, while also recognizing the inherent limitations of such an acknowledgement. Welcome to Leslie Art and Design and to the Civic Symp Practice Symposium, Reimagining Community Futures Through Arts and Philanthropy. Organized by MFA candidate and member of Art Place America's executive leadership team, Adam Erickson. My name is Katherine Shozawa. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the College of Art and Design and a practicing interdisciplinary social practice artist. I want to also begin by thanking Amy Green Dinas Dean of the College of Art and Design for her brilliant leadership and especially to Ben Sloat and Rebecca Joy for their generous collegiality and enthusiasm for collaboration. And to Adam Erickson, thank you for bringing your practice and your incredible work and lens as a cultural producer and administrator through Art Place America to Leslie Art and Design and for inviting me to be a part of today's conversation. At Adam's request, I've provided a land acknowledgement statement, which is commonplace at conferences and events in Canada, but less so in the United States. Adam has also invited me to talk a little bit about my own community-based art practice and provide an overview of the work of the Office of Community Engagement here at the College of Art and Design. Last June, when Adam and I began talking during the MFA Visual Arts Residency, I was thrilled. Actually, I had to suppress my enthusiasm. I was so excited <laughs> to have Art Place in the house. Um, I was thrilled to learn that we have many points of connection through sites and organizations I've been fortunate to work with over the years in cities and communities of contrast um, that have received generous support from Art Place America. Work that navigates the pragmatic and the symbolic including North Philadelphia's Pearl Street Project with artist Rick Lowe of Project Row Houses and with graduate students from MICA, the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle, and Kobo at Higo with Chio's Garden adjacent to it, where I was an artist in residence at an historic five and dime store, now gallery, in Seattle's International District, which in the 1940s welcomed and assisted families returning to the West Coast after being separated and incarcerated during World War II. The Murakami family providing meals and provisional housing in the backroom spaces. This is particularly significant for my practice based in Canada, where I belong to a generation of artists, the first in our families to not be incarcerated for our race and ethnicity by the country of which we are citizens. In my case, I'm among the first in four generations. I tell you this to highlight the conditions and contexts that define our subjectivities as artists and educators in a flawed democratic society, and what Ashley Hunt refers to as the contingencies of context, the complications, the unpredictabilities, in which geography and with whom people we make our work. 
This makes me think of the generation of artists that we can anticipate resulting from the detention centers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Even before the days I was at grad school or at the Whitney Independent Study Program, where art, theory, and activism are integrated, or teaching in the MFA program in community practice at Moore College of Art and Design, a program resulting from a partnership with the city of Philadelphia. As a post-redress artist, my work focused on history, place and meaning, and belonging, currently in tandem with affordable housing advocates who provide support for vulnerable First Nations communities in Vancouver's historic downtown east side. Locally and closer to Cambridge, an MCC-funded work, Vita Project, addresses cultural vitality and qualities of life through a series of culturally responsive performance prompts in public space. So, now about the Office of Community Engagement at Leslie Art and Design. Um, the Office of Community Engagement is a uh, socially engaged art and design initiative that connects Leslie Art and Design and the Lunder Art Center to communities in Cambridge, Somerville, <coughs> and Greater Boston. The office is the first of its kind at Leslie and specific to and housed in the College of Art and Design, created when the school moved from Kenmore Square, Boston to Porter Square, Cambridge, five years ago, with the Lunder Art Center designated to be a cultural and community hub for the university community, community partners, and the neighborhood. The work is primarily externally facing with the general aim of bringing students outside the walls of the school and the public in. So this is uh, Parking Day 2018. One way of looking at this exciting swath of work, which I feel very fortunate to be a part of, is to sort it into three general areas. Connectivity, visibility, and access. Connectivity. Uh, with connectivity, I'm referring to fostering partnerships with external organizations and collaborators, gathering the Dean's Community Advisory Council, which meets quarterly and includes Chris Hope from the Loop Lab, Lillian Sue, Director of Public Art and Exhibitions for the City of Cambridge, and uh, the Curator from the Greenway Conservancy's Public Art Program, to name a few. Visibility. Visibility, I'm um, referring to developing externally facing events, workshops, uh, co-developing events, <coughs> student-led participatory projects, in the public realm, like the annual parking day, that encourages students to talk with strangers. <laughs> taking, taking baby steps to social practice, and part of the third year elective course that I teach, socially engaged art in interdisciplinary studies. Um, notably, the vast majority of my students have been commuters who return daily to their original neighborhoods, um, communities, and geographies. So that really deepened our field work together. Oh, so thirdly, access. Here's where I find a concentration of Pablo Helguera's actual as opposed to symbolic or direct equity work. Securing funding from generous family foundations for free public programs and need-based scholarships that waive tuition and fees for talented high school students nominated by their instructors to take first-year college credit-bearing courses at Leslie Art and Design. This work is particularly in response to the growing socioeconomic gap particularly in Cambridge and neighboring Somerville. When you represent higher ed, families and guardians ask you to open the door. Lower the barriers. The experience for many residents being that they are not benefiting from Kendall Square's um, innovation district in Cambridge. This issue is a hugely significant guiding principle in a long-term collaboration with the Foundry Consortium, a partnership with the Lemelson MIT program an arm of the engineering school and the city of Cambridge to redevelop a mixed-use, self-sustaining building in East Cambridge that meets the needs and wants of residents. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, to you Adam Erickson, organizer of this symposium and an MFA visual arts candidate at Leslie Art Design. Um, a little bit about Adam. That's great. Are you good? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. I am I'm thrilled to have you all with us tonight to hear from a really stellar group of thinkers and change makers. 
2020 marks an important year for the United States. We're living in a turbulent time. Trust in our institutions and in one another is plummeting to historic lows. Fear and cynicism seem to govern our discourse. And yet, when we take a closer look, when we zoom into the community level, we can find cause for great hope. Because despite declining to tr trust, large numbers of Americans value cooperation and collaboration. And at this historic moment, what could be more important to discuss and enact than efforts to weave the social fabric of our communities? So before I tell you about the agenda for tonight and introduce you to the speakers, I wanna thank Catherine um, in the Office of, of Community Engagement for being such an incredible partner uh, in making this symposium possible. It wouldn't have happened without her collaboration. Um, and I also want to thank Ben Sloat and Rebecca Joy uh, in, from the MFA and Visual Arts program here at Leslie for supporting this effort. Um, I also want to thank Hanmin Liu for the generous grant he made, which allowed us to hire the Loop Lab, a uh, media group based here in Cambridge that you're going to learn more about tonight. Um, and they're going to they're video record and share these discussions as a future resource for all of us here and for those who couldn't be with us tonight. So tonight we're here to explore how the expanding practices of artists, philanthropists, and community developers can help cultivate democratically minded communities that are healthier, more equitable, and more sustainable. We'll hear from local and national voices about how creative people can catalyze economic change, bridge divisions, and foster meaningful connections between people. So right now, I'm going to give you a, an overview of our agenda for the symposium and introduce you to each speaker briefly. You can find a full bio for each speaker on the printed program by pointing your camera at the QR code or by going to my website, adam ericssoncom civic. And for a deeper dive on that, um, on that program, you can find a free resource that's online um, offered by each speaker in the symposium tonight, something that pertains to their work or that they're thinking about tonight. So let's get into the agenda. We'll kick off with three short presentations, three short talks. Um, and then we're going to move to a panel discussion for about an hour with some incredible practitioners who are with us tonight. And after that, we'll have a closing reflection and, and that'll bring us to the end of the program. And so to, to kick off these short talks, we're gonna have Jan Ajikos talk about expanding models of artistic practice. Jan is an award-winning art critic and historian who's based in New York City. She's a contributing editor with Art Forum and is a contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. Her writings appear in a variety of publications internationally. Jan teaches here at Lesley University in the MFA Visual Arts program and also at New York University and the School of Visual Arts. After Jan is gonna be Sarah Reisman talking about expanding models of philanthropic practice. Sarah is also based in New York. She's the executive and artistic director of the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation which focuses on supporting art and social justice through grant making, exhibitions, and public programs. Sarah previously served as director of New York City's Percent for Art program and is a respected curator having worked at Queens Museum, New Museum, Socrates Sculpture Park, and the Philadelphia ICA. She also currently teaches at the School of Visual Arts. Then I'll be back up to share a little bit about civic practice and Art Place America. And after that, we get into our panel discussion. And, um, and this is going to be a really exciting and dynamic discussion uh, of, of practitioners who are, who are sort of embodying this sort of civic practice. Uh, and they're going to have a dialogue. They're going to share some of their work with you and have a dialogue together uh, to exchange sort of ideas and thoughts about this work. That portion will also have a Q&A. So we'll have some time for questions from the audience and some discussion as a larger group. So on this panel, Christopher Hope is the co-founder and executive director of the Loop Lab based here in Cambridge, which is dedicated to empowering young adults of color to enter the careers in the AV and media arts industries. Chris is also an accomplished audio video professional and on-air DJ. He serves on the board of directors of the South Board of Advisors for the South by Southwest Festival, and he also serves on the My Brothers Keepers Keeper Task Force for the Obama Foundation in the Cambridge Mayor's Office. 
Uh, joining Chris is Joseph Kunkel. Joseph is a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation. He is director of the Sustainable Native Communities in Santa Fe, New Mexico, operating within Mass Design Group. He's a community designer and educator focused on developments throughout Indian country. Joseph's work includes exemplary Indian housing projects nationwide, and his career is centered on community-based design, material research, fabrication, and construction. In 2019, Joseph was awarded an Obama Fellowship for his work in the Indi 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 indigenous communities, excuse me. And uh, on, on our panel also is Karen Young. Uh, Karen's a cultural organizer, artist, and educator living in Boston. Her primary art is the Japanese drum, taiko. Karen works at the intersection of art, grassroots organizing, and policy. As a Boston artist in residence, she used the arts to organize elders of color from Grove Hall. She founded the Genke Spark and Brookline Cherry Blossom Festival, and she's a Live Arts Boston awardee and a Boston Foundation Neighborhood Fellow. And moderating that discussion is my colleague, Danya Sherman. Danya is a Boston-based strategist and writer who specializes in developing initiatives that build a more creative and just society. She teaches, speaks, and consults nationally on organizational change and creative placemaking through her consulting firm and with Art Place America. Previously, she founded and directed the public programs and community engagement at Friends of the High Line and co-founded the MIT Case Study Initiative. And we have a, a very special closing speaker with us tonight. This is someone who's very important in my life and whom I admire deeply, not only because he's my boss, but, uh, but because he possesses the rare ability to balance strength and vulnerability a sharp wit, and an abundant grace. F. Scott Fitzgerald said that the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. <laughs> if that's true, then Jamie Bennett has a mind of the highest class. <laughs> Jamie has been at the seat of influence in arts, government, and philanthropy for many years. Before becoming the executive director of Art Place America, he held positions as Chief of Staff for the National Endowment for the Arts and as Chief of Staff for the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. He's also provided strategic counsel at the Agnes Gunn Foundation and worked at the Museum of Modern Art. So with this remarkable lineup ahead of us, let's not waste any time in getting started. So please help me welcome Jan Ajikos to the podium. Hello, everybody. Ooh, a chorus tonight. Right off the bat, I admit to some early confusion. Exactly how should we phrase it? Art as social practice? Social practice as art? In recent weeks, as I prepared for this event, I found myself asking, what's at stake when art is thrown into the equation of some sort of social practice. Furthermore, I wondered, why stipulate an artistic practice as a social practice? Does the addition of the qualifying term social practice shift art into an entirely different register? Is art as social practice a new model? How is it informed historically? What sorts of assumptions, nuances, and subtleties are at play? I felt the need to prowl around the precincts of these and other questions in an attempt to clarify what we might mean by these terms today. I say today because we have been debating relationships between art and the social sphere, between art and everyday life, for well over a century now. To quote from Boris Groys' essay, the weak universalism. In these times, we know that everything can be an artwork, or rather, everything can be turned into an artwork by an artist. He goes on to say that it becomes impossible to distinguish the presentation of the everyday from the everyday itself. The everyday becomes a work of art. There is no more bare life, or rather, bare life 
exhibits itself is something that the artist shares with his or her public on the most common level of everyday experience. To be an artist has already ceased to be an exclusive fate, instead becoming an everyday practice. Grace's comments are predicated on the idea that art is fundamentally social. From inception to production to display, there is an inherent expectation of an other, an audience, if you will, and that applies, among many things, the desire to communicate and to activate social spheres that lie beyond the production studio. But here's the rub. It's not all one big, undifferentiated field of participant viewers out there. Who do we want to communicate with and what will be the nature of the communication? When we conceive of social practice as a component of art, it would seem that we are specifically emphasizing an engagement with the everyday world. Does it necessarily imply a turn away from the art world as well? Cultural demographics are at the heart of discourses about social practice and invariably play a role when we think about differentiating one audience from another. From inside the beltway to the middle of nowhere, people have vastly different needs and experiences when it comes to art. Who is art for? What is art for? These very big questions loom over considerations about audiences and viewers. It's no secret that many are alienated by official art worlds and seek alternatives that might purportedly restore art's, art's authenticity and mitigate the market-based hierarchical and competitive models that prevail at present. Indeed, today's art worlds are as conflicted as the culture we live in. I quote from Michiko Kakutani's article in the New York Times from the December 29th Sunday paper. When the 2010s began, we believed that technology would save us, that American divides could heal, that international institutions and alliances could deliver change. By 2016, that had all fallen apart. Everything has only gotten worse since then. But what comes next? That's the end of her quote. Let's leave aside the larger issue of creeping cultural malaise for the moment and keep our narrow focus. Many are asking what comes next when reflecting on how radically co-opted art culture has become. Some might see artists and organizations engaged in social practice as a kind of antidote or resistance to the obscene commodification of art to art worlds that cater to sheikhs and oligarchs, hedge funders, and the rest of the 0.001% that contribute to the global disorder. Small galleries are losing out to conglomerate galleries who are internationally based and who offer their global clientele investment grade art and tax-free trans transactions. Artist communities are ripped apart by developers, greedy to capitalize on the ambiance brought to formerly derelict neighborhoods. Suddenly, a 275 square foot studio in the far reaches of Brooklyn rents for $1,600 a month. Sorry, no lease. The latest version of the neoliberal operating system brought to us by the Trump administration is into cruelty. Thousands of migrant children held in metal cages at the border. Food stamps sliced in half without the benefit of new job training programs. Steady demolition of the Affordable Care Act that attempted to guarantee access to health care for all. A billionaire secretary of education who is eviscerating student loan programs. Let's not presume that government funding for the arts is going to do anything on behalf of art or the people. Even Big Bird is under threat of extinction. If we are to harness art's productive energy effectively and use it in service of social change, we can't look to anybody but ourselves. Of course, the picture I've sketched, turn our backs on the institutions of art for they are the culprits and fire up enthusiasm for a renewal of grassroots isms as the new authenticity is a flawed model of thought. 
It's far too unproductive to think in terms of us versus them. We could name so many artists who are at the top of their game in the gallery museum system and who are also socially motivated to speak about injustice, to valorize people who have previously lacked positive identification, to expose cultural crimes, to reach out to under addressed audiences, or to hold a mirror up to this really weird cultural moment. Amy Sherrill, Kahindi Willey, Kara Walker, LaToya Ruby Frazier, J.R., Christoph Buchel, Dred Scott, Ai Weiwei, Nan Golden, Tanya Bruguera, Mel Chin, Brandon Ballinger, Agnes Dennis, Dora Economou, Sonia Karana, Simone Lee, Hito Steirel, James Bridal, Trevor Paglin. We could go on well into the night naming artists who are socially minded who work inside and outside the institutions of the art world. And we haven't even mentioned curators, writers, and historians who extend artistic practice into discourse and preserve it as history. We take note. Social practice has become a very popular and perhaps very necessary idiom of thought and action, increasingly so as we move deeper into the 21st century. Social practice is such an expansive model, a new complex fold in the historical record that returns us to conversations about authenticity and also to activism. The activist impulse that ignited in the 80s and 90s, spurred in part by feminist practices, the urgency of the AIDS crisis, I think that's commenting on where I am in the text right now. <laughs> the glaring lack of diversity that contributed to the disturbing whiteness of the art world, it's back today, bigger and badder than ever. Today there's an emphasis on narrativity and storytelling and interest in socially motivated contents that are up to the task of representing these unparalleled times. Perhaps we found ourselves at the crossroads built of such egregious extremes and such highly fragmented ideologies that we somehow feel the need for art to justify itself and not distract us, just as we must find clear space to examine and re-examine our own lives. There's an undeniable whiff of desperation in the air because it can't all keep going on like this. I think art shares this burden. What many mean by social practice today is about developing consensus and community, about breaking down oppressive models and forging new relationships for positive change. We've all read about the new MoMA realized with a budget of around $450 million on the latest renovation and expansion. Yes, they did lay off quite a lot of staff, offered many early retirements, and fought unionization. And like museums around the world, the politics of some of their donors are impossible to justify. Need I say more than the Sacklers? But museums are our cultural treasures, too. And like the gallery system, we embrace them and need them, foibles and all. While collectively aligned with elitism and money, they also guarantee physical spaces dedicated to fostering engagements with art. That in and of itself is an inherently social model. Tens upon tens of millions of people flock to MoMA every year, no doubt, unconcerned about the politics of the institution. If MoMA represents the superhighway of art, at the other end of the spectrum are the country roads where art and audiences are constituted on a very local level, which means millions of dollars don't flow through their hands to facilitate meaningful encounters. A lot of creative social practice takes place out in the field, so to speak, and finds fodder in the everyday, putting life on display, activating new encounters, fighting for social justice. But think about it for a minute. Viewed in relation to the so-called everyday world, art as social practice is itself a pretty sophisticated concept. You mean art can be something other than an object or an image? Lots of folks are not prepared to accept that. Art as idea, 
as action, as utterance, as a mosque, as a dinner party, as running for mayor in a small town in Cuba. These examples are not problematic concepts for art professionals, right? A banana duct taped to the wall, produced in an edition of five, is perfectly accommodated by the traditions of ready-mades and certificates of authenticity that are foundational to a lot of minimal and conceptual art. What I find interesting about the revival of art grounded in social practice is that it's not new to our times. Rather, social practice is a core foundation of what might be summed up as the modernist inquiry into the limits or ends of art. Whether art extends or disappears into the everyday world, whether it gains new audiences for art or ceases to be recognized as art at all, these questions were paramount concerns throughout the historical avant-garde. Again and again, the problems of audience were addressed. Clement Greenberg and Walter Benjamin, two important theorists writing in the 20s and 30s, are on different sides of the fence on many theoretical issues regarding modern art, but both were concerned with the masses. Are they equipped to deal with high art? Greenberg said no. They are not interested, not sufficiently educated, and they don't have enough time outside of work to pursue art. Benjamin, on the other hand, argued that if high art doesn't have anything to do with everyday life, it becomes irrelevant. In the early days of revolutionary Russia, social practice partnered with radical politics and thought. Alexander Rodchenko, after producing his monochromes, retired from painting, picked up a Leica 35 millimeter camera, and photographed Russia's industrialization. He designed workers' clubs, political posters, and information kiosks, all factor among the earliest examples of social practice in art. You didn't have to go to an art space to participate in culture. It was everywhere around you. Rodchenko identified with the workers and wore a pair of workers' overalls designed by the artist Varvara Stepanova. She pioneered what we might think of today as social sculpture in her designs for women's sportswear, which itself was a very revolutionary concept in 1923. She also produced abstract designs, some realized as paintings and some printed on fabric, as if to pose the question and answer it at the same time, what's the difference between a canvas and a curtain? Maybe there's no intrinsic difference at all, except for how we talk about it and the distribution network through which we encounter it, whether it's in a gallery or the window of a dry goods store. The Futurist distributed manifesto leaflets to the public from the top of a bell tower in Milan, and the Futurist kingpin Marinetti staged a boxing match, notably one of the first performances. Sonia Delaunay intended her cubist patterns to function both as paintings and as quilts. Marcel Duchamp created his alter ego as a woman, an embodiment of an alternative aesthetic, and thereby questioned the fixity of gendered identity. To the passerby, a beautiful woman walking down the street, a boxing match, or some fabric in a store window have nothing to do with art until you identify the producer as an artist. Or think about this, El Lizitsky's idea to realize one of his abstract crown paintings as a three-dimensional performance space to be activated by you, the viewer, who literally is invited to walk in and to inhabit the artwork. It's a painting, it's architecture, it's what we came to call installation art and it's decor, all at once. This simultaneity leads us to focus our experience on how something feels rather than solely what it looks like. There are so many experiments in early modernism situated in the flux of the everyday and art. What do workers' overalls and bed quilts and boxing matches and chameleon identities have in common? Out in the real world, you would never know something was art unless it was discussed as such. The activation of public space engages viewers who don't necessarily gravitate to art or even need to think about something as art. 
Many artists, for example, have utilized advertisement spaces, renting billboards or ad spaces and buses and subways to convey messages, to influence people to fight for a cause. In the 80s and 90s, a new wave of social awareness began in art. Artists collaborated and collectives were formed and mobilized in protest against forms of discrimination and injustice with a shared intent to open up art to wider public audiences. They included in New York, Grand Fury, ACT UP, Group Material, The Gorilla Girls, The V Girls. Individual artists were also active on these fronts. Barbara Kruger designed a subway poster campaign in support of a woman's right to choose. Felix Gonzalez Torres produced photo murals on billboards that referenced the tragedy of AIDS and homoerotic love. An art aficionado might recognize these efforts at art, but most wouldn't have seen them as anything other than public service advertising, but nonetheless took their messages to heart. Tactical maneuvers are prevalent today. For the 2017 Venice Biennale, Christoph Buchel transformed a building in Venice to function as a mosque, which it did. The city forbids mosques and promptly closed it down. Point made, governments discriminate. At this year's Venice Biennale, Buchel hauled in the wreckage of a ship upon which many immigrants died attempting to cross the Mediterranean to freedom. Discussion ensued and the whole thing went viral. Art is a mirror of cultural dysfunction, in this instance, playing to an art audiences, but also to the international media and whomever else happens to be walking by or tuning in. Many artists function out of the spotlight entirely. Brandon Ballinger and Mel Chen are both artists and environmentalists and are involved in creating communities that dedicate their energy and resources to understanding our relationship to planet Earth. Their practices are not gallery-based, although they do have websites. Ballinger currently works in Louisiana, and Chen recently won a MacArthur Award in support of his work. Social practice has become a unique cultural space in which artists and activists and grassroots folks come together and join hands in common cause. Think about Dred Scott, an artist based in Brooklyn. Recently, he realized an endeavor the Slave Rebellion Reenactment, six years in the making, to reimagine an 1811 Louisiana slave uprising with 500 others. <coughs> Participants followed the same 26-mile journey that 19th century slave rebels had traveled along the Mississippi River through rural parishes and KKK territory en route to New Orleans. Dressed in authentic period costumes, they chanted freedom songs as they brandished muskets and axes and other improvised weapons. They also engaged with local communities along their journey. Whether an individual is an artist or not, it's almost beside the point. Who do we recognize for their social practice today? How about Greta Thunberg, who began her climate crisis movement by declaring, declaring Friday a strike day from school for the climate? How about the recent Heisman Trophy winner, Joe Burrow, a quarterback from LSU, who used his televised acceptance speech to call attention to families in poverty. At last count, $370,000 had been raised to help the poor community he comes from and others like it. Let's give a shout out to Habitat for Humanity, a volunteer organization that builds and renovates houses to help challenged communities. In my small Hudson Valley town, Newburgh, they recently completed their 100th house. Artists work as volunteers alongside everybody else who wants to make a difference. In conclusion, I want to reiterate, art has a tendency to be social, to not be contained or constrained when it comes to conceiving of new models for engagement. It might be impossible to define social practice comprehensively enough even at a panel with such knowledgeable participants. But there is no denying that social practice in art and beyond is everywhere today. Whether we call it art or not, there's a coming together across disciplinary <coughs> boundaries to work collectively and collaboratively and creatively to forge paths to better times. Thank you.
Um, now I turn the podium over to Sarah Reesman. Um, so I want to thank Adam for including me in this fabulous lineup. Um, I spent the last year being his mentor uh, at the invitation of a number of people. It started with Peter Ostofsky, then Ben Sloat, and then Jamie Bennett. I got like three different sets of calls and text messages last year right around this time. There's somebody you need to meet to work with. And um, I, you'll see why. <laughs> um, but it's really wonderful to be here on Leslie's campus. I've never been here so until yesterday. Um, so the talk is titled Expanding Models of, of Phil Philanthropic Practice. As I have 15 minutes, um, I'd like to qualify. It's unlikely that we'll change any models right here and now. But maybe we can shift our thinking towards a formulation of new models. Let's start with what we know. Um, what do we know about philanthropy? Um, its dictionary definition, wait, I think maybe I want to, is um, goodwill to fellow members of the human race, especially an active effort to promote human welfare. But the second definition is what I think most of us associate with philanthropy, which has to do with making a gift um, or a, a contribution of funds, right? So it can be an act of goodwill to fellow members of the human race, um, but it, it can be an act of goodwill or it can be an act of allocating funds. I'm repeating this just because that's really where we stand, I think, um, culturally. <coughs> but going back to assumptions about philanthropy, I think most of us will draw some connection to charity. Um, I want to ask, what are the differences between philanthropy and charity? I know that philanthropy is done voluntarily, um, and charity is considered an obligation in a number of cultures and, and religions. So thinking of Judaism, Islam, and Catholicism, um, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, one of the points that is interesting is it's a little over 100 years since 1917 when the US tax code began to incentivize charitable giving. So what you may or might may not know is that individual taxpayers have been able to deduct charitable contributions from income that might otherwise be taxed. So individuals can deduct cash and certain other contributions up to 60% of adjusted gross income, AGI, in a given year. And I promise I won't continue with these kinds of statistics <laughs> or <laughs> terms I don't fully understand. Um, <laughs> before the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the limit was 50% of the AGI. Only taxpayers now who itemize may take the charitable deduction. Most taxpayers instead claim a standard deduction, which is generally larger than their potential itemized deductions. So it doesn't provide a tax incentive generally to make charitable contributions. Um, and so it, it's kind of unclear, even somebody running a foundation, what does this really mean to the philanthropists that, that I work for? Like, I, I think we can, I'll just put it out there that I think a lot of funding is drying, right? Or kind of scaling back. and. I was uh, texting with a, a colleague at, who is a grant makers in the arts, which is an annual com conference, and I asked her, so is anyone talking about the tax, like the tax law change? And she said, oh no, not at all. So <laughs> it's not a conversation to have there, but maybe elsewhere. Um, then in 1935, um, this is just a point of interest that uh, the Congress extended the right to deduct charitable contributions to corporations. So that meant that corporations and it means corporations may not deduct more than 10% of their pre-tax income in a given year. So that kind of follows the religious model. Um, let's see what we want to. So I talked a little bit about the differences between charity and philanthropy. Um, and then what I want to talk about is that the source of philanthropic funding, as Jan started to describe, um, how the funds are made, how the, how the funds are kind of allocated is often at odds with the activities that they support. So if we think of a museum and we think of opiates, right? Or we think about the border. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I won't go too far into this because we don't have a lot of time. Um, what I will say is that, um, I wanna just mention there was an article last summer, two summers ago um, in the New Yorker, Gospels of Giving in the New Gilded Age by Elizabeth Col Colbert. Here she wrote about Andrew Carnegie's The Gospel of Wealth. Some of you are probably familiar with that publication. Um, and his quest to figure out what to do with his riches. So quoting Colbert, passing on riches to one's children was a mistake, Carnegie argued, for inheritance often work more for the injury than for the good of the recipients. Handing out money to the poor was similarly ill-advised since neither the individual nor the race is improved by almsgiving. So Colbert goes on to say, rather, the best way to dispose of a fortune was to endow institutions that would aid those who desire to rise. Those are Carnegie's term, words. Universities were a good cause, so too were the public libraries, music halls, and swimming baths. The man of wealth, 
in quotes, Carnegie advised, should consider himself the mere trustee and agent for his poorer brethren, bringing to their service his superior wisdom, experience, and ability to administer, end quote. It's a good article. I'll just mention again, it was August 20th, 2018. Um, I read it on a long ride to the beach, <laughs> a subway ride to Brighton Beach. Um, so I'm going to just shift gears and reference the foundation where I work and talk a little bit about how we rethought our own philanthropic process, because I think process is something that is often quite opaque to the public and to organizations and artists and individuals that are seeking funds. Um, so one of the things that um, I noticed when I started working for the foundation was that um, a lot of philanthropy takes place in ways that are based on existing networks, lack transparency, and selectively engage with the field. So think about what that means. Um, for foundations that are looking to promote equity or inclusion or access, which are kind of my own ideals or my ideals within my, the work that I do, um, that, that model doesn't really work. Um, in 2015, we launched our first open call to New York City nonprofits. We started with a series of closed roundtable discussions drawing together a group of um, different groups of organizations that were working in the fields where we thought art and social justice would come together. So public art, art in the context of service and community centers, um, arts education, artistic activism, um, emerging artistic practices, things like that. Um, and so as we did that, we, we wanted to better understand what the related but not always connected fields of art and social justice needed. Um, in our grant making guidelines, we specify the kinds of activities that we think will most effectively activate collaboration bet between art and social justice and also introduce values that we hope to see the upheld in our grantee activities. So that would include, I think this is, here are the values, but probably not so easy to read from so far away. Fair pay to artists, activists, and cultural producers. Do you know how many organizations have programs that they seek funding for and there's no line item for a fee to the artist who is at the very center of the program? It's appalling. Um, a commitment to accessibility and disability rights. That's something that has, I think, for a long, t not forever, but for a period of time, been pretty invisible. Um, an articulation of diversity by each applicant organization to understand the different ways that diversity can be defined. Um, that's very interesting, because depending on what um, the cultural community that your work is for and about and coming from, there's going to be a very different sort of notion of diversity. Um, so here, I'm just going to, this, this gives you a look into our portal, SurveyMonkey, if you will. And um, I won't, uh, it, it really just gives you a snapshot of like the mechanics. And it's something that we s had to set up because I was determined that if we had an open call, what we needed to do was bring together a group of um, grant reviewers who would participate in the process. Um, so the chart of, um, outside grant reviewers. So we engage about 15 or 16 grant reviewers. They have diverse cultural backgrounds. That's partly by virtue of being in New York City. They also work in different fields. Um, so this was for 2020. And we're just at the point where we're about to make the, the decision for this year. Um, you get a sense of the kind of uh, roles that they play. Not all of these are equal. So it's gender. There was nobody who was gender nonconforming in the group. So that's something we have to work on. Um, academics, administrators, writers, curators, artists, immigrant people with disabilities, which is running off the um, <laughs> here, um, and then queer identified. Um, so then one of the things that we do is we look at, um, we kind of take a stock, we do this in order to understand how, like to what degree are we meeting the needs of our applicant pool. So you're looking at a snapshot of kind of crude statistics based on the 2020 applications, which were all submitted by September of last year. Um, and you get a sense of different artistic practices, literature, film and media, performing arts, dance, theater, design, visual arts, which is surprisingly low on the list and theater is very high, but that has a lot to do with the scale of kind of performing arts versus visual arts in a city like New York. Um, and then this becomes, um, this is again looking at the activities that I mentioned or the sort of art and social justice areas that we tend to support though not limited to. So art in the context of service and community centers, public art, emerging artistic practice, community-based museums. There are a number of them in New York City, which is why they're a category. Arts education and then artistic activism. And a lot of these activities overlap with one another. One application, say from the Queens Museum, would hit probably for four out of these points, four different areas. So 
applications by theme. And this is probably harder to see for those of you who are farther back, but I'll, I, I think this is important because um, a number of foundations have kind of set a, a, a priority. It might be um, criminal justice reform or environmental justice. And our attitude, given that it's New York City, we don't have the largest pool of funds to work with. We would let the field tell us. Um, and so this gives a sense of 2020 applications for this year. Um, you have a couple of applications focused on Islamophobia, First Nation and environmental justice, feminism, disability, court diversion and incarceration policies, uh, community building, Asian American culture, didn't, we didn't have very many applications from the Asian American community. Um, African American history is something that's emphasized, feminist uh, cultural production, and on and on. So um, part of what we do is we, we take this snapshot and when we make the final decision we compare to make sure we're, we're responding to the needs. And then this is the budget size and um, I don't know if anyone is that interested in this but um, you, it, the, there's sort of an area of 250,000 to a million operating budget is what we're targeting because what we've realized is a lot of the bigger foundations working in the same space don't, don't pay attention, can't really engage with smaller organizations from a million and below. I think that's true. And then here you have a list, and this is, again, somewhat hard to see, but I can name a few of these. We worked with a metrics um, consulting firm to, do, to come up with an index so we could identify criteria and values um, that were important to the foundation, and then transfer those or offer those to the grant reviewers to come up with um, a kind of measuring stick to figure out each application, what criteria and values do they meet. So some of these values are diversity, fair pay, equity, recognizing local cultural tradition, access in terms of disability. These were ones that were prioritized. And this year what I realized is we needed to take, we have 26 criteria and values. It's far too many to have someone look at 60 applications and assess each one each time, right? And they're writing feedback in narrative form. So I said pick five to 10 and then use those as your index. Um, so that was interesting to get feedback from the reviewers about what they felt were most important. But now I want to talk about the spiritual aspect of charity. Um, in all of my experiences uh, working for foundations and grant-making organizations, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the New York City <coughs> Department of Cultural Affairs, and now the Rubin Foundation, I keep going back to something that's in my Jewish education as a young person, which I don't even think was very clear to me, but there's somebody named Maimonides, and he had a ladder of something called Sadaka. Um, <laughs> so some in the room may know this. Um, I will mention a little bit about Maimonides. His name was Moses ben Maimon, commonly known as Maimonides. He was also referred to by the acronym Rambam. Um, he was a medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages. In his time, he was also a preeminent astronomer and physician. Born in Cordoba, um, Spain, on Passover Eve in 1135. Okay. Um, once his body was taken over to the Lower Galilee and buried in Tiberias. But more importantly, or important here and now, since I have three minutes, um, is Maimonides' Eight Degrees of Sadaka. And you start at the top and you go work your way down. At the bottom, you have kind of the worst case scenario for char Jewish charitable giving. Um, the person who gives reluctantly and without, with regret. Reluctantly and with regret. That's, that's the lowest form of giving. Above that, the person who gives graciously, but less than one should. <laughs> Above that is the person who gives what one should, but only after being asked. And I like this because it's as if Adam and I, we live in this small village, and he knows I need something, <laughs> but he doesn't want me to have to ask. And so that would be next up. The person who gives without knowing, um, the person who gives before being asked. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Fifth, on the fifth rung is the person who gives without knowing to whom he or she gives, although the recipient knows the identity of the donor. And then we go up, the person who gives without making his or her identity known. This interests me, and we'll come back to that. The person who gives without knowing to whom he or she gives, and the recipient does not know from whom she, he or she receives. So it's this kind of anonymous exchange. The person who helps another become self-sufficient through a gift or a loan by finding employment for the recipient. So the top is actually a lot like grant making, except the names have become so important. And I thought a lot about this because when I started working for the Rubin Foundation, I was like, it's interesting. You think about branding philanthropy and making it known and promoting it so that, first of all, so people know they can apply for a grant. That's very, very important. 
Um, if they didn't know, then it's not an equitable process, right? Um, so pushing that word out so that people have access to the information about the opportunity. Um, but then there's also the issue of naming um, becoming this question mark for me, thinking, <laughs> is it vanity? Is it cultural capital that a philanthropist is essentially purchasing through the grant making? But as we've seen in the last year and a half with um, what's happened at, uh, let's say, the Whitney Museum with Warren Canders or with the Sacklers in a number of different venues across the country and even in Europe, there's, there's an awareness that the name matters. And I, I guess I, don't, I didn't want this to be my conclusion for the talk because I have more to say, but I think that the naming is actually quite critical because it does hold accountable the patrons so we have an understanding of where the money comes from. Um, and I just will quickly breeze through some images. We do exhibitions at the eighth floor um, and they're meant to be um, a promote kind of dialogue amongst the grantee community and beyond that we serve. Um, and so a current exhibition is called Relational Economies, Labor Over Capital, which looks at alternative currencies and relationships that people have economically to not one another. Um, there are some labels on these slides, so I won't uh, go into the details, but um, you're looking at alternative currencies by Stefano Tsivopoulos. An artwork on the right is by Danilo Coriale about how to forget work, a post-work economy. Um, free text by Stephanie Sajuko. And then we have um, an artwork by Tanya Condiani, which is called Contos de Trabajo. And it's looking at um, a kind of post-slavery celebration of freedom in, in Cuba, in Trinidad, Cuba, in, in a former sugar plantation. Um, and just this, this exhibition is important as a con conclusion to the talk. Um, in the Power of Your Care is an exhibition that we organized in um, 2016, and it looked at the interdependencies of care in our culture. It was at a time when the Affordable Care Act was just being introduced, just rolling out with some bumps, right? Um, and so the exhibition included works by artists like Hunter Reynolds, um, Joe Spence, Frank Moore, and Hannah Wilkie. Um, and so it was, a, it was a mixture of artworks that really looked into, you know, what are the politics of care? How are artists articulating care through their work? And then Carmen Papalia is a good place to end since he was the re his work is the resource that I put forward for this um, convening. Um, this is an artwork called White Cane Amplified. And here he's um, using a megaphone instead of a white cane, which is used uh, for kind of for basically to find one's way if, you're, if you have visual impairment or vision loss. Um, so it's a performance to make, to amplify this experience of blindness. And here he's leading a group of us from the Rubin Foundation offices in 2016. Um, in an accessibility workshop. Um, so it's a closed eye walk in which a group of participants, mostly arts administrators who were grantees at the time, um, walking with our hands on the shoulder of the next person, eyes closed, um, as a way of uh, recalibrating our relationship to our a sense of embodiment, right? So it was a way to kind of begin to have a conversation about access that was suddenly very personal. Um, so I, I guess my proposition to you all is that Philanthropy, a new model, while it still needs to involve money, it should also involve care. Thank you. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to start with kind of a, a quote that really struck me recently. Um, and I think it's, it holds equal weight and is, is pertinent to our discussions tonight. It uh, holds equal weight for organizers and artists developers and for philanthropists as well. This is from Saul Alinsky, the celebrated activist and founder of Community Organizing, who says, when we respect the dignity of the people, they cannot be denied the elementary right to participate fully in the solutions to their own problems. Self-respect arises only out of people who play an active role in solving their own crises and who are not helpless, passive, puppet-like recipients of public or private service. So now let's take a look at uh, a definition of civic practice. This comes from my colleague Michael Rode and the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, which is the group that coined this term in 2012. They say, civic practice is work that brings artists into collaboration and co-design with community partners and local residents around a community-defined aspiration, challenge, or vision. 
Alinsky might have said that at some level this work is about respecting the dignity of communities, <coughs> cultivating self-determination and self-respect. And let's also understand that civic practice, as it's described here, is nothing new. Sorry for this cheesy historical rendering. Um, it's the only thing that I could find, but you kind of get the idea. My colleague and friend, Michaela Shirley at the Indigenous Planning and Design Institute, recently reminded me that civic practice is actually an ancient art form. Since the earliest civiliza civilizations, artists, designers, and creative people have helped their communities thrive. In fact, the origins of the arts around the world appear to be from this kind of participatory, community-based, and inclusive practice. For those of us today who are familiar with the contemporary art world, there are a few helpful ways to distinguish between the conventional studio practice, the more recently emerging social practice, and civic practice. CPCP says studio practices when artists make their own work and engage with the public, neighbors, and residents as audience. And social practice is when artists work with the public, neighbors, residents on an artist-led vision that involves some level of community participation and intention of social impact outside the traditional audience experience. So this is an artist-led vision. And then again, civic practice happens when artists co-design with neighbors and residents. The spoken intention is to serve the self-defined needs of a community or public partner. This is about serving the needs of a community. Now, additionally, there's four key questions uh, that, that kind of help clarify intentions and outcomes between these three practices. Who decides? Who executes? Who benefits? And what are the stakes? So for example, a painter will take de make decisions about her canvas size, materials, and composition. She'll execute the work, and hopefully she'll benefit from its production, as will audiences who view her painting. Her livelihood, time, and resources might be at stake. And for each of these different practices, the answers will change. So when you hear from our panel of civic practitioners in a few minutes, it might be interesting and worthwhile to think about the, these questions in relation to their work. And I also want to make a, a really important point, which is that this is not a scale of good, better, and best. right? So I believe that a healthy arts ecosystem includes all three of these practices. Um, and in fact, I mean, most of the artists that I know who have a civic practice of some kind also have a studio practice or a social practice as well. Today in the United States, creative people across the country are helping address community challenges and opportunities in work that tends to be highly collaborative um, in, and cross-sectoral in nature. So you might have an artist and a city planner, a housing developer, a health administrator, um, an elected official all kind of working together on an initiative. And funders do play a big role as well. Over the last decade, the organization I work for, Art Place America, has been a major funder in advocating and, um, and sort of funding this kind of work by investing $100 million in projects across rural, suburban, tribal, and urban communities of all sizes. We've also invested in research, knowledge dissemination, and field building. Just a quick background of Art Place. It was launched in 2011 when the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Rocco Landesman, brought together the heads of 16 foundations, eight federal agencies, and six banks. And amazingly, all of these people agreed that many traditional planning and development efforts in the US had fallen short of delivering healthy, equitable, and sustainable outcomes in communities they, they said they served. So these folks saw that artists and arts organizations were developing the kinds of human-centric, contextual, adaptive solutions that could strengthen communities from within. And to support that and advance that way of thinking, the, this group of collaborators established Art Place as a 10-year fund to position arts and culture as a core sector of community planning and development. So, Art Place developed some interesting frameworks and helpful things. Um, I'm not going to get into this too much in this talk, but we have a lot of resources on our website, and I invite you all to check that out. Um, first and foremost, just to mention, is that sort of our, our work has funded a, a, an expansive view of art and culture. So there's at least 10 different artistic disciplines um, that we've been able to, to fund doing work in communities. 
Um, and we've also created this sort of, we call it the community development matrix, or lovingly the bingo card um, of community development that sort of talks about the different sectors that you often find in community development or in most communities. And then across the top, um, you see the different players, civic, social, and faith-based organizations or commercial entities, governments, nonprofits, and philanthropy. And conspicuously missing from this is arts and culture. But the reason for that is that we believe and that art can and does play a role in each of these. Um, and, you know, in fact, it's also, we find, art is incredibly effective at helping these different sectors and players work together and work with the communities that they serve. So while Art Place, the collaboration, isn't unprecedented in philanthropy, it certainly isn't common. And because of this unusual structure and ongoing commitment of funding over the course of a decade, Art Place has been able to codify and strengthen a national field of practice, which in turn has helped support the dignity, self-determination, and cooperation of hundreds of communities. As a society, the benefit I see from this kind of participatory, cooperative, and trust-building work is that it's making tangible our interconnections, shared interests, and our shared fate. And I believe much more can be accomplished when the many stakeholders involved see themselves as part of a larger cultural and creative movement. Art Place's investments of over $100 million <laughs> in 10 years is only a beginning, and there's an important opportunity to support and sustain that work in the future seems to me that this work which builds trust in a time of deep distrust and cultivates social cooperation in a time of great division can help prepare the ground for deeper unity and solidarity among people. The future of this work will require coalitions of forward-thinking artists, community developers, and philanthropists who will invest as partners for the long haul in the ideas, the people, the networks that are weaving the social fabric of our communities. I believe a society can be healthier, more equitable, and more sustainable when communities are supported to be more creative, more democratically minded, and to animate their network of mutuality. So to conclude, I just want to return to Saul Alinsky. He insists that community-based efforts like civic practice share an ultimate goal by saying, the real democratic program is a democratically minded people, a healthy, active, participating, self-interested, self-confident people who through their participation and interest become informed, educated, and above all, develop faith in themselves, their fellow humans, and the future. So you're about to hear from a panel of civic practitioners who are doing exactly this, each in their own way. So please help me welcome our moderator for the discussion, Danya Sherman, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about what's next. Thank you so much, Adam, and thanks to Leslie for hosting us here today. Um, before we move on to Christopher Joseph and Karen's talks, um, I just wanted to let us all get a sense of who's in the room and give us a chance to stretch for a second since we're about halfway through our program. Um, so feel free to stand if you'd like to just for a brief second. And while you do, just welcome you to identify yourself with a sound or movement or a clap. Um, just those of you who identify as an artist. Who's in the room? Artists. All right. How about community development practitioners? Anybody doing community development work? Fewer, but here. OK. Educators? All right. Um, students? What else? Who else do we have in the room? Lovers. Excellent. Activists? Organizers? Fabulous. Um, how about those of us who are, who are here in town from the Boston region? Great. Most of us, but not all of us. New York City, New York region. Okay. Um, Santa Fe, I know at least one of us. <laughs> Minnesota, I think some of us. Great. Where else? Seattle. Seattle. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Everyone can take a seat. Um, 
One of the things that I love most about the work that I get to do as a consultant is that it's evolutionary. Um, the work that I get to do also changes me. And one of the most profound changes that I've experienced through my evolution um, in civic practice and learning in civic practice is that um, I sort of thought maybe from a younger age that the work was out there and I realized that the work is also in here. Um, I think that civic practice um, is not just uh, a set of cerebral techniques and ways of bringing together the arts and community development, but it's at its fullest um, a reimagining of the fabric of our society um, and the institutions that we've come to rely on in some ways. Um, I think that civic practice calls on us to tear down and rebuild um, some, some worlds where we can be free to practice our cultures and express ourselves worlds where um, race and gender and nationality are no longer tricking us into thinking that our success depends on how assimilated we are into white, heteronormative male society, um, and um, allowing us to really access the deep wisdom that we have as human beings. Um, and that comes from this spirit of creative collaboration. And I think, um, as you'll hear from Christopher, Karen, and Joseph, um, in order to do this kind of de deeply interdisciplinary work, um, civic pract practitioners are constantly challenging established norms and power dynamics um, and oppressive ways of working. Um, so as you listen to Christopher, Joseph, and Karen, I welcome you to consider two things, which are things that I'm thinking about a lot these days. Um, what are the cultures that you're currently practicing right now, and who's in your communities? Um, and what are some established and oppressive norms in your field that you no longer care for that civic practice could help you challenge? Um, so with that, I want to move on to, we'll hear from Christopher, Karen, and Joseph, and um, afterwards engage in some uh, panel discussion and question and answer. So please help me welcome Christopher Hope from the Loop Lab. Good evening, everyone. You can do a little bit better than that. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. I would like to say uh, thank you so much, Danya, but also thank you to Adam Erickson for kindly inviting myself and also the Loop Lab to be here to support this incredible conversation. Um, I'd also like to give a huge shout out to Art Place America for really supporting the work that we're do we've been doing here in Cambridge and beyond. Thank you so much uh, to Jamie and the uh, Art Place America team. In addition to that, I would like to say thank you to Leslie University, uh, Leslie College of Art and Design, School of Art and Design, as well as the MFA program for allowing us to be here as well. So a little bit about why civic, sorry, a little bit about why civic practice in the arts is really uh, informative uh, for myself. One of the things that I want to do is take you back to 2014. At that time, I was doing ministry at a church in, call, uh, in a neighborhood called the Port Neighborhood. The Port Neighborhood has several project developments, and in those project developments, you have roughly a little over 100 young adults, mostly young adults of color, second generation, Im second generation immigrant, and also first generation immigrant communities. And within the midst of that, I was doing a lot of ministry work, and at that time, I was at Harvard Divinity School. So through that experience, I ended up becoming a mentor for many of the young adults in that neighborhood. One in particular is named Kinsley David. Kinsley David was a 24-year-old um, Honduran-American young man, very bright, um, just had a really fascinating outlook on life, very creative. He loved hip-hop, loved rap, and was also very much engaged in doing uh, video, video music uh, in, in, in that community. And so as a mentor, I was trying to push him a little bit harder and harder every single day to try to put himself out there. But unfortunately, because he aged out of a lot of the programs that could have provided some kind of arts-based social services to him, uh, he unfortunately, and also he had a history, criminal background history, he was unable to really get over that hump. And in those conversations, um, Kinsley also had a four-year-old daughter. So he was a young man trying to you know, make sense of the world. And on July 3rd, 2014, unfortunately, he was murdered. And it hit really close to me as someone who was a mentor, as a colleague, um, as a friend, and at the same time, be having a community so close to the biotech space, so close to the tech space, 
and just surrounded by it. You think of the possibilities. You think about equity. You think about broken dreams, stolen talent. And so from at that action, um, at that time, I also had a radio station on WHRB, Harvard Radio. So I, and I had years of doing radio broadcasting. It really inspired me to think, how could I honor Kinsley, but also other young adults in that neighborhood, the Port neighborhood? And so talking with my uh, other mentee, Mo Moise Michelle, who was to give a shout out to him, the other co-founder of the Loop Lab, we really canvassed that neighborhood and talked to 18 to 30 year olds really asking them, if you had a blank check, what would you want to do? What would you want to learn? And the two most consistent things that came up in a, a lot of those interviews and through those surveys was economic opportunity and creativity. People wanted creative outlets to express themselves, but also to earn a living, earn a living for themselves and their families. And those really began the seeds of what's called the Loop Lab. And so the Loop Lab, is, our mission is to really empower people of color and women in the media arts to develop careers through audio, video training, and also job placement. We do this by providing a six-month curriculum that teaches students creative workforce training. It also includes audio, video recording, audio, video editing. And I want to give a shout out to Tevin and also Nico, who are here in the, in the building right now, it's two of our recent graduates. Okay. But we really do what we can to also, and when I say we, I want to give a shout out to also our program manager, Matthew Malakowski, who is always the incredible uh, linchpin to our program. Shout out to you, Matt. But teaching these young adults the, the hands-on skill, as well as client relations, professionalism, other soft life skills that are very critical, such as financial education. Our, all of our students are 18 to 26 years old and all come from low-income backgrounds and underserved communities. Specifically, it started in the port, but now it's grown to include other parts of greater Boston. 100% of our young adults are underrepresented in the audio-video industry. So, for example, 70% of our enrollees, they're second-generation uh, immigrants, 20% are first-generation immigrants, and 10% are American-born blacks. We are also working really hard to ensure that women who are grossly underrepresented in the media industry also have a seat at the table and have access to our program. Once a student has completed the six-month curriculum, they are then placed on a paid internship. From there, they're offered opportunities to gain experience in media work, including working as videographers for our for hire services, such as Tevin right now and Nico right now working for hire. This is one way that we sustain the work that we do here. Um, and we provide quality video services for companies, foundations, nonprofits at a third of the market price for video services. For these services, we hire our students and alum and allow them to really gain the valuable experience that's needed to be in the field. So far, we've graduated two full cohorts and we've just enrolled our third. So very grateful about that. Thank you. And of these 50% of, of our students, 50% are working in the AV industry, 30% are pursuing entrepreneurship as contractors, and 20% are pursuing higher education with our partnership, Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, where they're pursuing free dual enrollment as well as, as an associate's degree program. So in 2020, we're really looking forward to working with uh, our third and fourth cohort of students seeking a larger workspace so that we can accommodate more students and also expand our offerings to the community. And we're really excited to partner with, this, uh, with current and also potential funders. Thank you so much. Next, so I want to start with a question. What do you see here? You could just call it out. Cow. Capital. City. Rural. Water. So these are indigenous lands. The urban, the rural, this is Indian country. The cultures, uh, the practices, we kind of see this as Indian country. This is also Indian country a built environment that doesn't represent a community's culture 
a community's place, a community's people. This is Indian country, Manhattan Island. This is Indian country, our nationalist capital. And this is Indian country, the lands that I'm standing on, the lands that you all are sitting on, home of the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Mashpee, among many other indigenous communities that have called this place home. These are native lands. That land acknowledgement that we heard that opened our, our discussion this evening is our connection to this place. I'm a practicing architect, a practicing designer. My connection to place inevitably allows me to understand how to build, what to build, who to build for, uh, how to engage with communities. It's that connection to place that is hugely important, how we think about our built environment, how we think about our, our, our natural environments and the communities which we serve. So why are we here? I think architecture design has a really important role. Architecture is never neutral. It either hurts or heals. Our mission is to research, build, and advocate for an architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. Historically, architecture has really hurt our indigenous communities. Our built environments, our housing, our schools, our places of service, our healthcare systems have really hurt our communities. And I think architecture has the power to really promote a place of human dignity. Uh, currently, 33% the, of Indian country lives in poverty versus the national average of 12.5%. There are 90,000 uh, homeless. There's a current uh, need of 200,000 units of housing in Indian country. Uh, and this is the budget that we get to use with, uh, get, to, get to build with, $653 million a year, plus minus. Uh, compared to the previous year, we're now in 2020, these are, this is 2017 and, uh, 2018 and 2019 statistics, uh, 674 million, which was our national budget for our Indian Community <coughs> Development Block Grant, uh, which is federal fund, funds through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. If we were to think about inflation, it would be around $900 million that we would get to use to build uh, and, and, and address that housing crisis that we see in Indian country. There are 573 federally recognized tribes, 329 reservations. If we were to divide that $653 million evenly, we'd be about $1.1 million per tribe per year, which would result in something, again, that is places that doesn't reflect culture, community, or, or, or place. So that's that idea of placelessness is what we're trying to address in the work that we're doing, working with communities to really address these issues. And I'm gonna quickly go into uh, a quick kind of a, a, a case study around Kiwa Pueblo, where we worked with tribal youth and taught tribal youth the kind of practice of architecture and how to communicate and use architectural language to work within their own community. We use that language to start to address how we think about the built environment, how the built environment can contribute to <laughs> advocating for their own housing, uh, housing uh, needs using technology, uh, identifying where housing, wh where houses were, how they, what is in good condition, poor condition, fair condition, uh, severe condition, as you can see here. Uh, this is also the, uh, the red line is the national record of historic places, the registry boundary, uh, or the blue one, sorry. During the work there, we redesignated that, uh, that, this red line to really signify what the national registry was. Uh, this, I this idea really kind of thinks about and, and explains how architecture played a role of really redefining what a tribe called historic and not the federal government. And so that empowerment of engaging with community really started to play that pivotal role. Uh, we started to address where were the housing needs, how could we use the federal funding in a way that really lifted up the community uh, from the inside out rather than the outside in. Uh, this idea uh, of understanding how to allocate those funds in a way that was kind of a point of sovereignty, a point of self-determination that allowed the tribe to do it itself. So I'll kind of end on this idea around a question. Why are you here? Uh, and how are you using the tools of design, arts, uh, architecture uh, to really advocate for your own community's voice? And I know why I'm here and the reason I'm here is for our next generation of tribal leaders, the future who are going to lead these efforts and, and think about how to change how we think about uh, community, community development and, and how our, our, our built environments are, are designed. So thank you.
Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to share with you just really briefly uh, my year as an artist in residence um, with the city of Boston. I'm super excited to see Karen Goodfellow, the director of Boston Air in the audience. Hello, Karen. <laughs> um, so I, in 2018, I was uh, selected as a, um, one of seven of the, boss, um, the artists um, who had the charge of using art, at art to address uh, city policy using a lens of resilience and racial equity. So each artist was um, housed and based and I uh, was partnered with a, a Boston Center for Youth and Families. And I was set up with the Boston Center for Youth and Families uh, Senior Center in Grove Hall. Um, I chose to work with elders. Um, and I, as someone who practices, my art is the Japanese drum, taiko, someone who is um, Asian American, purposely wanted to be um, with black and brown elders in the city. Um, so I want to start actually by sharing with you um, a video um, that we created um, in our first two months. Um, as an artist, I'm really curious um, at looking at issues of power, identity, and oppression, and what actually happens when you strike the drum. Oh, we have no sound. <laughs> so I'm really curious about what happens when you can use art as a way to gather people and build community and also talk about um, power. So we, I taught weekly classes um, at the Senior Center, but I also, and in Tycho, but I also um, taught classes, we had discussions um, around what did it mean to be an elder? What does it, what's hard? What's challenging? What's good? Um, what are issues that are invisible? Um, and one of the key issues that came up was street safety. There's a crosswalk right at the, at the community center that's right next to the library, as well as the school, where cars would not stop. Um, it was clear um, that something needed to be done. So we hosted a rally. Uh, we brought the drums out. We partnered with many different community organizations. Um, and um, 
we got the uh, Age Strong Commission and others involved, and um, we held, uh, a, as I said, a rally and produced a video that went all over City Hall, and we're able to get a community meeting um, uh, organized where uh, the Boston Transportation Department um, and Vision Zero were got involved in actually um, altering and modifying this the crosswalk so that uh, they could cross safely. So that's one of the projects that happened. But they want to continue. They want to be on the Ellen Show. Um, they want to, um, and so Live Arts Boston just gave us a grant this last year to continue our work to create an older and bolder anthem. And they're very very strong um, in the community wherever they go. Thank you. So we're going to invite um, Danya, Joseph, Karen, and Chris up to the stage to have a discussion. Working? Okay, great. Okay, another round of applause for Christopher, Karen, and Joseph. Um, not only for your amazing work, but your ability to condense your work into extremely short <laughs> few minutes each. Um, so just really wonderful to be here with you all. Um, so yeah, th we talked about a few things in advance, and so um, one of the questions that's been on my mind is how, um, in learning about all of your work over the last couple of years, um, if you could speak with the audience about how your work challenges um, challenges existing normative or maybe oppressive norms um, in the arts field and the community development field or the other fields that um, that you're working in. Do you want to start, Chris? Absolutely. So as an equity-facing arts organization, we are actively changing the reality of oppressive ways every day. Um, we're not a big organization. Um, however, through advocacy and influence, and being on panels such as this, we get a real awesome opportunity to talk about equity in the arts. And not just equity in the arts as in respect to artists getting funding to do the art, it's also addressing the ecosystem that supports the artist, right? Uh, so the, the video camera person, um, also the soundboard, who operates that? I think that's also a huge um, part of it. So I'll, sh I'll say, for example, um, I was on a panel a few weeks ago in DC, and this was a part of a, a conference for audio video industry. And one of the questions that the, the moderator asked me, interestingly enough, was how can companies, AV companies, audio video companies, really support your young adults? How can audio video companies really talk about diversity and equity and bring in more people into the field? And one of my response was really simple. It was just being able to change the requirement of not having a car, right? Or, or, or there being a, a, car, a driver's license requirement makes a huge difference. A large number of the young adults from our demographic either don't have cars because they live in the city, they, they, they don't need a car, and at the same time it's expensive. And many of them are just at a really early part in their point of their career where they're trying to get to a point where they can have a car. And so just by a, a, a policy change as simple as that, from upper management to make a world of difference. So I think being able to be in spaces like that to get people to really think in a different way about complex problems um, is really helpful. Anything. Okay. I just briefly yeah. want to say you don't usually see elders playing Teichel. <laughs> you don't see groups of elders in our art spaces. Um, and, you know, in this particular project, it was about engaging and activating elders, not, it wasn't about dementia, dementia prevention, as important that, as that is. It wasn't just about, you know, exercise and combating so, social isolation, but it was really about engagement um, and really acknowledging and respecting what they have to offer. Um, and yeah, just sort of building on something that you said earlier, just in terms of um, Tycho as an art form and something that we've been talking about um, over time, Karen, um, if you could talk a little bit about how you define your work, I know it's evolved, um, and language, um, you know, as Jan and, and others talked about earlier, is definitely evolving in this field, um, and so I'm wondering, um, sort of how you do describe your work these days um, and how that's evolved over time and some, some thoughts on that. 
I have to say, um, so I've been playing Tyco for over 25 years, but until I applied for the Boston Air Program, I didn't really consider myself an artist with a capital A. I knew I was a cultural, um, cultural artist, but I didn't, the reason why someone forwarded the RFQ was because of the organizing that I do. And that spoke to me directly because everything that I do and who I am and how I think about, um, you know, arts and culture in particular, you know, Japanese taiko drumming, the festivals is about sort of bringing myself and my family and my heritage here with us. Um, and so I, I saw myself an organizer. I have 20 years of organizing in the youth community, but um, the arts was something new to me. I, Strangely, never called myself a musician either. Um, and um, these words just don't, you know, fit in my mind. I play taiko, it's part of who I am and where my family comes from. Um, and so um, I have to say, the first time I applied for Boston Air, I really, um, I didn't make it and I bombed a question. Um, I was asked, what can you describe your civic practice? And as much as I had been engaged and rooted in community organizing, I couldn't talk about that. I wasn't, I didn't even know how to think about the word civic. Um, and I thought about post office, what's, you know, and City Hall to me, which was my whole year of learning about City Hall, was always a place you, you know, avoid because you're going to get ticketed, fined, you know, something, you're in trouble for something. You don't want to be part of City Hall. And so this whole year has been a, a, an amazing learning year. And so in terms of how I describe my work, I try to use every word I can, you know, arts organizing. Um, now I, I talk about, um, arts and activism, I do talk about um, civic practice, I do talk about, um, you know, social engagement, but I have to use all the words. You know, the first time I showed up into the arts center, I mean, to the senior center and said, I'm here as a Boston artist in residence, I had to explain that it wasn't, I, was, I wasn't gonna sleep, you know, at the senior center. It's not a residency where I sleep. So all this language really has to be broken down to be real. Um, and I think we can't just use language, we have to use video and photos and we have to see, you know, the work, um, not just use words to describe it. Mm -hmm. Anything else to add on that, Joseph, Chris, language issue? Uh, yeah, I mean, so when thinking about working in Indian country uh, and in and outside of Indian country, a lot of the times I'm finding myself liter like tra translating what it means to be practicing design in Indian country? What does it mean to translate like an indigenous way of thinking to a, a majority uh, old white male, male dominated uh, practice, right? And so how do we think about accessing architecture in, uh, in, in Indian country? And it's historically not been accessible. And I think that's what we've been trying to do is breaking down those barriers of how do we bring good design that uh, these communities, probably uh, mar more marginalized communities, just don't have access to. And I think that translation of language and, and the design language is hugely important. Thank you. Um, Joseph, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, maybe talk us through an evolution of one project, um, you know, thinking about Adam's juxtaposition of civic versus social versus studio practice um, in typical studio practice or in an architecture studio as well. We would think about the end result and goal being all about the product and what you what you yeah. finish with, right? And so I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if you could talk about how that might be different in, in this work, in the civic practice work, and what that looks like for you. Yeah, and I mean, it's definitely a process, right? Uh, I don't think we engage with a community uh, with the end result already being a building, right? If, if, we're, if our goal is to build a building, then we're not necessarily doing our job. I think our goal is to really define the mission of the project. What is the community trying to achieve through its built environment? And if it results in a new building, that's great, but I don't think that's why we start there. I mean, uh, with the work at Santo Domingo or Kiwa Pueblo, my job there was to listen. I, I spent basically a whole year trying to understand how can we attack, how can we solve the housing crisis uh, within the Pueblo. And through that process, I, I started to reveal that 75% of the community members relied on the arts as a main source of income. So. Me as an architect, how do I make that more possible? How do I start to work with the community and allow the community to be the architects of their own vision? And I think that became my goal. And inevitably, by stumbling, bumbling through the process, 
uh, started to understand what maybe civic practice meant in that in that uh, in that community. And I think it's different within every community we work with. Is just trying to understand how to navigate that and and do it in a way that is lifting up the community's voice rather than my voice. Thank you. Um, so uh, we talked. We heard a wonderful talk about philanthropy and very direct um, sort of engagement with thinking about the resources that um, help all of our work move forward and sometimes also um, can be impediments. Um, and I'm wondering if we could just hear from each of you a little bit about what kind of resources, um, if you had a you know blank slate, like what kind of resources would make your work easier, right? We're, we're operating within several structurally underfunded fields of the arts, of social justice work, of community development work. Um, so yeah, and, and what might sort of resource you know, holders sort of learn from, from the challenges and, and um, opportunities of your work? Do you want to start, Chris? Yeah, sure. So there are so many art-focused program programs for high school students that are out there. However, when we talk about this 18 to 26 demographic, it's almost like it's a, a forgotten population. And that's where we come in as the Loop Lab because we're noticing even with funding for programs that targets this population of young adults who uh, are not in college or have left college for various reasons, yet are unfortunately opportunity youth seeking some kind of achievement, seeking some kind of opportunity to get to that next stage in their life. And so being from, coming from kind of our boots on the ground perspective, uh, philanthropy could definitely do a lot to support this demographic and really be intentional about that 18 to 30 year old demographic. As far as um, ways to potentially also support the, the mission that we're doing, uh, we really need long term funders that are invested in equity in the media arts that really see this as, like Dr. King says, a fierce sense of urgency, that there are people that have a story to tell. And what better way to empower people through, uh, through freedom and liberation by giving them the tools they need, not only to provide for themselves and their families, but to tell the story of their communities, right? And so I think that being able to support our mission on the long term is critical, um, but also high level advocacy on the state as well as federal side. Um, we talk about more funding for programs um, such as ours and others that are really doing this work. And uh, the last thing I'll say is also uh, the Loop Lab is really seeking a, a space um, at no cost or low cost by partnering with a larger municipality or a larger organization that would really allow and enable us as an organization to serve more students. Every semester we have to turn away uh, a multitude of students, not because they're not eligible or they couldn't do great in the program, we just don't have enough space. And so I think being uh, thoughtful and intentional about that from the philanthropic side is, is really powerful. Thank you. Yeah, funding. <laughs> Civic practice art is so hard to talk about. Um, it's really hard to talk about. And, um, you know, when I ran a youth advocacy program, I could raise, you know, $100,000, $500,000 easily, ask for two and three year, year grants, but this kind of work is really hard to, um, to, to really write about and talk about, and I think um, it's been really difficult as an individual artist to actually think about, like, long-term sustainability. That's kind of what keeps me up at night. You know, you apply for a bunch of grants, you wonder what's going to come through, maybe nothing, maybe everything. Um, and so, um, uh, sort of having folks understand what this is and what it looks like um, is a huge barrier. Um, also, I think um, you know supporting um, individual artists to be part of these conversations. Um, just having a conversation recently about being at the Arts Equity Summit um, and that like arts administrators can come and they're salaried so they can come and be part of these things. So it's not just enough to support artists registration fee, but can you support our time? Um, NIFA, the New England Foundation for the Arts, just, you know, funded, um, uh, just actually supported the finalists that were applying for the Creative Cities grants by giving them $1,500 to write the final proposal, acknowledging that, you know, these kinds of grants that you're asking us to, you know, to apply for take a lot of time. That's a real acknowledgement of sort of what the reality of our lives look like. Yeah, no, um, arts, 
social justice community. Let me give it some context in Indian country, go back to some of the numbers that I presented there up on, uh, during my uh, quick talk. Uh, 573 federally recognized tribes. There's $650 million that get, gets dispersed among the 573 federally recognized tribes per year. If you were to divide that up, five, that $653 million by 573, that's about $1.1 million a year per tribe per year. That equates to about three homes. Uh, when you have a 200,000 unit housing gap, it would take about 117 years to build uh, that 200,000 units of housing, which is not acceptable. So that right there is a discrepancy. And so what I think philanthropy's role is in this kind of conundrum is how do we leverage philanthropy to access more capital? How do we use it in a way to kind of open up the markets to the, the banking institutions, the financial institutions that have real power to make a dent in that 200,000 unit housing gap? And I think that's where, that's the big number that uh, we're, we're looking at is how do we start to address some of these, some of these issues? It's kind of, it's funny but not funny. I'm sitting in the office and my colleague and we're kind of mapping out this kind of big big idea strategy and here I'm responding to a housing director that is in need of building four units of housing and I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm trying to figure out how to have her put her 16 uh, capital decks together federal funding philanthropy state funding tribal funding and just trying to figure out how to organize it all Bureau of Indian Affairs funding and, and this is taking my time away from some of the other time that I need to kind of focus here. And just going back and forth to kind of understand how do we support those individuals, those housing directors that are in the critical need of, of, of design expertise, and then also look at the big, the, big, uh, the big numbers that we need to address. And I think partly it's how do we start to address these issues on the ground and kind of these national thought leadership work. And it's, it's, uh, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, great, well thank you. I thought maybe we can take a couple of questions from the audience. Great, um, yes. And I'll repeat your question if you wanna so, just. Um, this, uh, so a comment to my ignorance, for example, just, uh, I'm a very new um, student for studying the issues of the Native Americans. And so I, so I have a question for Joseph. <laughs> Joseph. So the, the large number of homelessness um, really puzzles me, and so I hear um, I hear a, a, a lot of uh, Native American people are forced out of their reservation by the change of ecology, for example, either um, nature change, natural change of our environment, or man-made uh, infrastructure change. For example, a building of a big dam and they were forced out reservation because they can't hunt for the food and all kinds of things. So, but but I wish I, I just came back from the um, the four corners and 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 appreciate what you can describe of uh, about eighty percent of the um, people you serve are artists. They 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 make a living by um, making artist artistic objects. So like the Zuni people, Santa Domingo, Navajos, and Hopi people. So I, 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 I'm just very curious about um, this 900,000 homeless people that you're describing. Do you, do you, can you talk a little more about how, how do they become homeless? Why, why is that number so huge in, in your perspective? So I'll just repeat the question. So the question was um, if you could speak a little bit more about why um, there is so much more and disproportionately more homelessness in Native American country. Yeah, and I think, so the number is 90,000 that are considered homeless, and homeless, uh, homeless. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot there in that question and there's a lot there to unpack that we can't really dive fully into, but uh, homelessness in Indian country is defined a little bit differently. It's usually around overcrowding, right? You go to a reservation, you don't necessarily see somebody living on the street. It's they're living in an overcrowded home, 900 square feet, 18 people living there, and that puts a burden on the infrastructure. It puts a burden on that that bathroom, the burden on that kitchen, and that starts to to, to deteriorate a lot faster than your traditional home. And so, how do we start? So. 
partly it's two-pronged. How are we investing in existing housing, bringing that up to speed, while also investing in new housing? And it, co it goes back and forth. I mean, uh, the, every community is different. Every community uh, has their own way of trying to solve this. And that goes back to the Self-Determination <laughs> Act that allows tribe to self-determine how they want to address their issues. You look at uh, uh, the various policies, Native American Self-Determination Assistance and Housing Act, the self-determination allows us to understand that. Um, every tribe, uh, yeah, every tribe has to address it in their own way, and um, it's, it's complex dealing with the federal government, local government, tribal government. Um, tribes are sovereign. Uh, we are, uh, we are, uh, and that's why when I introduce myself, I'm a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation. I'm not, it, it's not a race. We're a people, we have political, uh, voice. We have a government-to-government -government relationship with the federal government, and so it allows us to understand how to address it ourselves. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. So the question is, how do you define your, your principles around philanthropic ownership? <laughs> I'll say this. What's really important for us is to partner with institutions, foundations, organizations that really are oriented into our mission. Mission first. You know, we, uh, we got into this, and I got into this, really with that fiercest urgency I was talking about with Dr. King, that there are people dying, not ever being able to achieve the maximum potential within the media arts field. And I'm sure there's permutations of any, all, all kinds of different fields, but just talking about the media arts space. And for us, uh, we look at our, our philanthropic um, donors and organizations that we work with as partners in this work. And so it's a shared ownership. Um, absolutely, like there's uh, opportunities for programmatic, um, <coughs> obviously aside from being on our website and making sure that we are doing what we can to big up them in every, every time we can. Um, also when we do like programmatic videos, because our students that are learning, they create videos during the, the program, being able to put those foundations on the, 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 end of the end credits, right? It's just like things like that really kind of let people know accountability, like we said earlier, uh, who's, who's supporting this work? Who cares about uh, people of color and women coming into this industry? Thanks. Any other thoughts? Well, I'll just say, you know, I, I've been part of ensembles and part of groups. My first, um, my first thought is to, we have a discussion. Um, and does this feel right? What are our missions? What are our values? Um, you know, as a performing artist, you know, I've been part of groups that have definitely turned down gig requests. Um, because of our values. Um, I have an Asian women's group that decided not to do a fashion show. Um, after a conversation with a designer about their, um, their, their thoughts around uh, um, you know, having a range of sizes uh, and really um, being in line with our view of you know, every body is a, is a beautiful body um, and decided not to. So I think it really, I mean, for the way I think about it is I think about the values and I think about having conversations with the people that you're working with. Thanks. Yes. A, a related question about philanthropy. Uh, we can sort of all agree that philanthropy is a, is a great thing, but it's also a sign of income inequity in many ways, in that we shouldn't really be in a position where we are dependent on um, Bill Gates to, to fund the arts. Um, and barring things like reparations, or um, certainly from where we're sitting right now, it doesn't look like the government's chipping in anytime soon, is there some way of building, I, I hesitate to use the word self-determination because it has almost a libertarian sort of sound to it, but building that into <laughs> the system so there's a kind of self-generating funding for something that, that, that makes you not dependent on this system and not potentially every compromise. 
Yeah, so the question, um, are, are there alternative financing, self, self-funded self financing systems that we can look to that might help us um, sustain our work? Yeah. yeah. I'll answer that. Uh, so there are multiple layers to what we do, and one of them that I think has been really incredible is when we talk about empowerment and modeling that for our young adults, that also means self-determination, self-efficacy. And as they are coming through our program, we model that, model that as an organization because very, as of 2019, 30% of our, our income actually comes from our for hire services. And so being able to provide high quality video work and video service work and also photography work for nonprofits, organizations, companies that may not have the money to, to bankroll a $50,000 campaign or a hundred thousand dollar campaign but perhaps they have five thousand ten thousand um, and to be able to also as a, uh, uh, through that model which I think is innovative through the social entrepreneurship aspect of it uh, we're able to be an employer so we hire our alum who graduate the program to do this work so as soon as they hit the uh, hit uh, grad graduation or even some now even during the program they get paid an opportunity above livable wage to actually go out there and do video capture, video editing. And so uh, that's one model and one uh, approach to it. But I think as an organization, as an organization that's doing this work, I think it's really important to think about those, those aspects of where, what are our assets and also what are the assets of the population that we serve that can help also um, allow us to be self-determined and self-sustainable. And I think that's attractive to a philanthropist. I think that's also very attractive to organizations that see that as a model for them. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I think about this all the time. Um, you know, the group that I, the project I started, Older and Boulder, has just become this they're an on fire group of elders that's become this message and, and brand, so to speak. There's t shirts are all in neon colors. Grandma's not only wearing them, but the nine year old granddaughter's wearing them because she's older now at age nine than when she was five. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like older and bolder. I want to be older and bolder as well. So, um, so, you know, they're being asked to speak. You know, um, the older and bolder anthem that we came up with has a spoken word aspect to it. Elders are talking about their lives. So now there's a speech fee you know and there's a there's a performance re revenue coming in and there's t-shirts and coffee mugs and stickers and all kinds of things coming out of it and so I think it's really important from the start to think about that kind of stuff and I just wanted to add also that there there we are living I think excitedly in a world of um, a lot of experiments in this um, space so land trusts and co-ops and you know other things that were around a long time ago, some stayed and now are being reborn. So it's exciting to think about how some of our systems of philanthropy and finance could help to sustain that. And that's a question that our place is going to be um, engaging with a little bit more in the next couple months and year. I think we have time for one more question. Not really. Okay. Ish? No. Okay. One more. Short question. Okay. Yes. In the back. Uh, sorry. In the way back. <laughs> Williams to Moses and Michelle. Uh, he's theory, so he him his. I actually have this question for, for Joseph. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the individuals in which you're serving, they have, um, they're artists. Um, I wanted to know what kind of art do they do? And like, what, what is the variation? And um, how can individuals support that type of art? So the question, um, what kind of artists, when you mentioned that 80% of the people that you're working with think you have our artists um, and are sustaining themselves with their art, what kind of art are they making and what kind of work are they doing? Yeah, no, it's an easy question. I, so the artists at Santa Domingo or Kiwa Pueblo, they're potters, jewelers, silversmiths, they're, they're, um, they're doers, they're bakers. Um, funny, when we engaged and had our first community meeting, I, I specifically asked how many of you are artists. Nobody raised their hand. Uh, and, and this is me going into the conversation knowing that a majority of them were making things to put, provide food on the table. Well, uh, we had to redefine how they define themselves as artists. They weren't professionally trained. They didn't go to school, but they were passed down from generation to generation. They are the fine artists. They make some of the most exemplary pottery that we can see to, to today. And so how do we lift them up? And how do we support them by their artwork? 
go to the art shows, go to the art fairs and buy their pottery, buy their jewelry. Um, the Santa Fe art markets uh, in Santa Fe, most of them, we were working towards a way of trying to get them online, but most of them are selling wares in, in Santa Fe and Albuquerque. The idea is that hopefully uh, artists would, uh, buyers would come to Santa Domingo to buy their artwork, but it's, it's a long-term, long-term Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much. For so um, now we welcome Jamie Bennett for our closing remarks. Thank you so much. One more time for all of these folks. So we're almost there. It's just me, and then you can get home to Ricky Gervais or whatever your evening holds <laughs> in front of you. Um, and what Adam asked me to do was sort of based on one of the things he's taught me in the work that we've done together, which is no matter how amazing a co conversation you choreograph, the more interesting conversation is the one that's about to happen, mm -hmm. right? It's the conversation we're all going to go have in the hallway outside. And so Adam asked me to share five noticing five things that I sort of listen to and I'm going to carry with me. Not the most important things, not the newest things, but just five things that I'm going to carry out into the, the Cubist conversations that I'm going to have in the hallway. And so the five things that I just want to share briefly with you are one, about human doings, two, about opioids, three, about a pronoun, four, about two kinds of people, and five about a conjunction. So human doings. I come from a faith practice that teaches me that people, we as people, are more than just the sum of our actions, right? And I think all too often in our society at the moment, we conflate people, their identity, with the things that they do. And Catherine started us off by talking a little bit and bringing into the room Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066 that 78 years ago incarcerated people in the United States who were Japanese or who had Japanese heritage, right? We were incarcerating people because of their identities. And she also showed an amazing slide of a wonderful thing called Parking Day, right? Neo-urbanists and students and activists get together and they sit and they have a good time in parking spaces, listen to music and hang out with each other. Well, at the moment, I live in South Brooklyn, which is a borough that's in a city that for at least two generations of mayors would incarcerate people for hanging out in the parking space in front of their house, right? So we have to be careful, I think, and remember when we're talking about human beings and when we're talking about human doings. And I loved, since we sort of, not quite beginning and ending, but since we started with the mention of the executive order, that we then had the beautiful taiko drumming that was brought into the room. So Karen, thank you for that. Two, opioids. The Sacklers were a through line through this entire thing, right? And the thing that I'd like us to leave and talk about maybe rather than the Sacklers is an article from the New York Times today about Hindman, Kentucky, and about the Appalachian Artisan Center, which is actually a project that Adam talks about in his thesis. And this is a story in the New York Times that Adam's had a hand in pitching. And it is a group of men, mostly, who are coming out of recovery programs, and they're actually making mountain harps. They're working at a luthier. And so rather than only allowing these men to have the identity of addict or of someone who's in recovery, they're actually embracing the beautiful generative heritage that makes that part of the world so special, that magical music. So maybe a little less time with the Sacklers and a little more time with Heinemann, Kentucky. Three, a pronoun. The pronoun is, of course, we. And I think interdependence is something that was woven throughout. Sarah Reisman talked about Maimonides uh, and the interdependency, uh, the exhibition In Your Care that was at the beautiful um, eighth floor 
uh, gallery, and Christopher Hope talked about the, the Loop Lab and the ecosystem that they're investing in, the generations of folks, the network of things that help someone succeed from having a car to having credentials to having access. And since Christopher was talking about an AV conference in Washington, D.C., I was reminded of a, a colleague of mine, a man called Andy Shalal. And Andy is a poet, and he's a small business owner, and he unsuccessfully ran for mayor of Washington, D.C. And when he realized that he wasn't going to be mayor, he published a blog post of some of the things he learned running at, for mayor of Washington, D.C. <laughs> and one of the things he learned was that white folks live in neighborhoods and black folks live in communities. And so think, when we think about that interdependency, let's think about are we starting with a place first lens? Are we starting with the building? Or are we starting with the we? Are we starting with who we are and what we're trying to build? Two kinds of people. An economist once semi-famously said there are two kinds of people in the world those who divide everything in the world into two kinds of things, and those who don't. <laughs> I think there are two kinds of people in this world, those who worry about what art is, and those who are too busy making and enjoying it to care. Right. <laughs> and I love that Karen, I love that Karen talked about struggling with that in herself and in her own practice. Um, I love that we, that Joseph sort of said, architecture is never neutral, it either hurts or heals. And so that notion of social impact art or social impact investing, let's set them aside. Because everything we do, we, that human beings do, either, either helps or it heals. Uh, either hurts or it heals. And so finally, a conjunction. And that conjunction is the and. And there's a Franciscan teacher that um, I read uh, on a daily basis, Father Richard Rohr. And he runs something called the Center for Action and Contemplation. And today's meditation was actually a meditation about what the most important word in that title is. And the most important word is and, right? And he wrote, no life is immune from suffering. When we are in solidarity with the suffering caused by pain, injustice, war, oppression, colonization, the list goes on and on. We face immense pressure to despair, to become angry or dismissive. When reality is split dualistically between absolute good and bad, total right and wrong, we are torn apart. The contemplative non-dual mind is not saying everything is beautiful when it's not. However, we do come to everything is still beautiful by contemplating facing the conflicts between how reality is and how we wish it could be. And that distance, that disconnect between how reality is and what we wish it would be is where the artists come in. And I'm guessing that folks in this room maybe are carrying with them Keats uh, and his negative capability. Uh, and if not, you certainly have F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, two opposed ideas at the same time and still being able to function. But what I'd actually like to end us with today is um, some words that were spoken by a former chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, a man that I worked with called Rocco Landisman. And he wrote that Darwin was perhaps the first to notice that art is a universal in every human society. The assumption, of course, is that if something is a universal, it is an imperative. But herein lies the conundrum. We can survive perfectly well as a species without art. It does not make us run faster or hunt smarter. It does not make us braver. It doesn't organize our work. So we have to ask, is art to human development what the appendix is to anatomy? Everyone has it, but for what purpose it may be hard to say. And I think the conversation that Adams guided us through over the past two hours has maybe, at least for me, helped me think about some different organs that art may be and not just the prehensile appendix. <laughs> so with that, hold yourselves for one second because I have a little bit of a list of folks that Adam asked me to sort of speak and thank into the room. And then I'll ask us to have a, a sort of big celebration at the end. And those thanks, of course, are the people you heard from today, Catherine and Jan, Sarah, Christopher, Joseph, Karen, Danya, the colleagues from the Loop Lab who have been recording this, the dean who is so great to host us here at Lesley University, the program director, uh, the faculty, the students, 
the staff, everyone who came out on this Sunday evening. I think we should all thank Adam's family, who tonight are represented by his wife, his mother, his mother-in-law, and a close family friend. So the four of you break the rule and applaud them. Yes. They did. Yes. And then finally, I think we're holding back our biggest applause to congratulate Adam Erickson on what he's been learning yes. and on what he's going to learn next. So please join me in thanking Adam, and then let's adjourn to the call.